at this point in using Zoom. Um, just keep in mind for the video and microphone icons in the bottom left there, they should be off or muted. Helps things to run a little bit smoother on our end. Um, and you should see a red line through the microphone and the camera icons there that we have circled in green. And also um, circled in green is that chat box. That's really how we wanna communicate with folks. So feel free to type in a question as I'm speaking and we'll try and address those as, as we go along because we want this to be as interactive and as fun as possible for everyone. And also when I'm in full screen, your screen is, is as well. If you need to exit the full screen, just use your escape button or push uh, exit full screen, which is at the bottom of your window. Okay, all righty. So let's get to maybe more of the fun stuff here. Um, so as Sarah said, I'm Jen Timmer and I'm not on the education team. I'm on the science team. I'm a conservation delivery biologist and I primarily work with our large breeding bird monitoring program that we run here at Bird Conservancy. And I'll be talking about that a little bit more later. Um, and at the moment, my favorite bird right now is in the top there in the center, red-breasted nuthatch. Um, I've been seeing a ton of these guys at our feeder and in the backyard. And I think what I like about them the most besides they're very pretty is that they're so small, but they seem very fearless. They're always the last one to leave when I'm refilling the feeder or when I'm out walking around. So I think that's pretty cool. And then Sarah, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, so my name is Sarah Doxson. I am an environmental educator with Bird Conservancy. Um, and this kind of this season, my favorite bird has been a Lincoln Sparrow. Um, and if you are a birder or just getting into birds, you know that sparrows are one of the more trickier families to, to master. So I feel like this season, the Lincoln Sparrow has finally been one sparrow that I've been, to been able to confidently um, identify. And they're just, they're really beautiful once you learn all their, their markings. Thank you, Sarah. I agree. They are, they are tough to identify as are all the sparrows. Um, all right. So for those who are maybe new to Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, this is just a little bit about us. Our mission is to conserve birds and their habitats through an integrated approach of science, education, and land stewardship. And simply, we want to see a future where birds are forever abundant. We like birds and, and we believe that other folks like birds and we want to keep them abundant on the landscape. Um, so I'm on the science team and we're trying to advance bird conservation through knowledge and then we have folks on the stewardship team who are working with private landowners to implement practices and conservation efforts on the ground for birds and then we have folks like Sarah and Tyler on our education team who want to take that information and they want to transfer it to the next generation so that we're not just helping ourselves but we're helping um, future generations to enjoy birds. And through all that, our work radiates across the breeding, wintering, and migratory ranges of birds from the Rockies to the Great Plains to Mexico and beyond. Okay, so I think a couple of you have already chatted with us in the chat box where you're watching from and maybe how many people are watching with you. But I'm curious, what bird do you see most often in your backyard or neighborhood and which bird do you see least often? And Terrence, I see your comment. I also really like common yellow throat. They are super cute bandits. Uh -huh. Yeah, so people are seeing blue jays and house finches in their backyard. Same here. Yeah, and northern flickers as well. Yeah. yeah, and it's kind of cool, the birds that we see less often, I think those are maybe the more fun ones because you don't see them so often. So it's a surprise, you're like, ooh, a Western tanager in the backyard or, or something. Okay, so in the webinar today, we're going to go over what it means to monitor bird populations, the importance of monitoring bird populations, methods for how we monitor bird populations, and how you can contribute to monitoring. Okay, so let's get started. First of all, what are we talking about today? What are we talking about with monitoring? 
Monitoring is simply observing and checking the progress of something over a period of time. In our case, we observe and check the progress of bird populations over time. So we survey their populations and determine whether they're increasing or decreasing for a specific area or region. But before we get ahead of ourselves, what do we mean by bird population? It simply refers to all the inhabitants of a particular area, so a number of individuals. It's also a particular group of birds living in a specified area or country. Um, what's our state bird here in Colorado? I'll give you guys a second to type that in the chat box. All right, I see a couple of answers here. Yep, lark bunting is our state bird. Um, so one example of a population would be all the lark buntings living in Colorado. And we use population estimates to describe a population. One common metric is size or abundance, which is just the total number of individuals within the population. So the total number of lark buntings in Colorado. Okay, we're gonna start with a little bit of trivia to get our brain juices flowing and because trivia is always fun. Um, okay, so what do you all think are the three most common birds in Colorado? And I apologize for our, our participant from Louisiana, although I'd be really curious on the common birds in, in that state too. Um, so the three most common birds in Colorado, feel free to type one or all three into the chat box. See, Canada goose, yep, there's definitely a lot of Canada geese. American robins, yep, well, I'd agree, there's a lot of robins in Colorado. Okay, well, let's say, or let's see what the survey says for the three most common birds in Colorado. So our most abundant bird in the state is horn lark. We have over 9 million horn larks in Colorado. Our second most abundant bird is the western meadowlark. We have just under 8 million western meadowlarks across Colorado. And bringing up the third most common, as Debbie said, American robin. We have just under 6 million robins in Colorado. I was actually hoping that that one of you would say robin because that's what you commonly see in your in your neighborhood or your backyard. Or maybe you would say black capped chickadee because you see lots of those in your backyard. But when we monitor an area like the whole state of Colorado, we have to take into account not only our urban areas and our backyards, but also the forests, the mountains, and the grasslands that make up the state. And if you go out to the eastern plains in Colorado, you're going to see a lot of horn larks and a lot of western meadow larks. Okay, so besides providing fun trivia facts, why do we monitor bird populations? Any ideas? Okay, to get trends. Yes, that is a good reason why we monitor. Yep, okay, so we wanna know what are trends of bird populations and what's the health of a population. Those are both good answers. Um, so there, there's lots of reasons. Um, birds are also important to the environment. That's a very good reason. Um, I would say one important reason why we monitor right now is that recent reports suggest many of our bird populations have been declining during the last 50 to 100 years in a variety of habitats, from grasslands to shrublands to forests. And grassland birds, such as the lark bunting, have experienced the greatest decline in population size. There simply are fewer birds today than there were 50 years ago. And in one recent study, researchers estimated a net population loss of almost 3 billion birds since 1970. This represents a 29% reduction in total breeding bird abundance across all birds, with more than 300 species showing a loss in population size. Without consistent monitoring programs in place, we would have no idea about this loss, how big it is, that it's even occurring. And on the other hand, if bird populations were doing really well, we also wouldn't know for sure without monitoring efforts. 
So besides keeping track of a loss of birds, we also need to know where to direct limited resources, such as time and money, to support bird populations. Which species or groups of species need the most help? And in a perfect world, we would have unlimited resources to do everything, to save wildlife species, to feed and house our growing populations, to maintain clean air and water, and also fuel our cars, buildings, and our planes. But because we don't live in a perfect world, everything is really a balancing act. So if we only have so much time and money to help bird populations, which ones need our help the most? And monitoring data can help us to answer that. So in that study that I just showed you, um, they found that grassland birds have declined the most in the past 50 years from conversion of grasslands to agriculture, changes in grazing practices, and climate change. So a good place to start would be directing efforts to conserve our native grasslands. But even within grasslands, we could probably further direct our limited resources. Mountain plovers are a type of shorebird that breed in grasslands with short vegetation and lots of bare ground. When mountain plovers were proposed for federal listing under the Endangered Species Act, surveys had only been conducted on public land. When biologists started to survey on private land, they found that there were actually a lot more plovers than anyone knew were out there. So the mountain plover didn't need to be listed for federal protection at that time. That meant that we could direct our limited resources towards other species that were more in need. So in addition to directing resources in the right places, we also need to evaluate those efforts to see if they're actually or even doing something that's harmful to birds rather than helpful. How many of you have heard of bird-friendly beef? Audubon started the conservation ranching program to provide consumers with the ability to buy beef that is sustainably raised and benefits bird habitat. But we have to monitor bird populations on the Audubon ranches to make sure that the practices they're using are indeed beneficial to birds. And if you haven't heard of bird friendly beef, um, it's pretty simple to Google and you can um, maybe find a, a producer in your area and then you're not only eating yummy beef, Jen, I think we might have lost you. I'm not able to hear you, but if is anyone else able to hear Jen? I think we lost Jen. Hang on one second, folks. Let's see if we can get her back.
Okay, folks, thank you so much for your patience. Um, I don't know that we're going to be able to get Jen back on. I have her presentation, so I'm going to do my very best to, to fill in um, and relay the information that she was wanting to share with us. So let me get my screen set up for sharing and we will forge ahead. Hopefully she's able to hop back on, but we'll see here. Thank you all for your patience. Okay. All right, let's flip through, find out where we were. Oops, hang on one second here. Oh, Jen joined us back in the waiting room here. Jen, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, welcome back. <laughs> hey, sorry, our internet just went out at the office. Oh, it's back. No, now. <laughs> no worries. Um, and I was, I was just saying, if that, if it does happen again, or if we keep going in and out, um, I have the presentation you sent me last night, so I can, I can do my best to fill in. But yeah. why don't you take it away, and we'll go for as long as we can. Okay. Um. All righty. Um. You might have to. Let me see. Oh. Do I need to make you the co-host again? I think so, yeah. Okay. Try and pick up where we left off. Okay, now you should be a co-host. Okay, share screen. Um, okay, share. Okay, do you see why birds or why monitor? Yes. Okay, great. Um, let me pull back up the chat box here. Um, okay, um, I can't see the chat box, it's, so if you don't mind, maybe just yeah. let me know. Okay. I'll definitely keep an eye on it and let you know what's happening. Okay. Well, okay. Well, sorry about that, everyone. Um, I appreciate it if you were able to stick around. Um, okay, so we monitor birds also because they move. They move around because of fire, roads, but also in response to resources like seeds and insects and nest sites. Um, they might even shift where they breed and spend the winter. But if we don't monitor birds every year, we'll miss those changes. And then we might falsely conclude that a species is or isn't doing well because we see more or less of them in one location. For example, Bird Conservancy has monitored birds out at Soapstone Prairie Natural Area in northeastern Colorado since 2006. After several years of monitoring, they noticed a rare visitor singing with the other birds, a bared sparrow. This little bird typically breeds in the grasslands in northeastern Montana, western North Dakota, and southern Canada, and that's shown in yellow on the map. After hearing this bird sing for multiple seasons, biologists found evidence that had successfully reared chicks. So proof that the bird was actually breeding here in Colorado. And this discovery was important because it means that this declining grassland bird has the ability to successfully colonize and nest in an area that's pretty far from its typical breeding range. And this ability is especially important as grasslands across North America are disappearing. Okay, so now that we know a few reasons why we monitor bird populations, how exactly do we do it? Any ideas out there? Feel free to type in the chat box. And don't worry, we'll be going over ways that we monitor too. <laughs> okay, so, Debbie says ban. Oh, you can see it. Okay. Sorry, I can see it now. <laughs> it came back up. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, so, so banding, bird counts, modus. Oh, that's cool that you know about modus. Um, yeah, those are all really good ways that we monitor birds. 
Um, and I'm glad one of you mentioned doing bird counts. Um, I figured that at least one person would mention counting singing birds during the breeding season. Um, otherwise, these are known as breeding bird surveys. Um, so that is one common way that we monitor birds. And during breeding bird surveys, observers typically record all birds seen and heard within an allotted time, such as five or six minutes. As you can imagine, this takes a lot of skill and practice because you need to be able to identify a lot of different bird songs and calls all at once. Many times you don't actually see the birds that are during a survey, but you hear them singing or calling. So imagine if that black capped chickadee in the picture were singing in one of those spruce trees in the bottom picture. You're probably not going to see it. Now, to make it a little bit more complicated, imagine if you have five separate black capped chickadees singing at one time and you can't see any of them. So keep in mind that you also don't want to count birds twice during a survey, so you also need to mentally keep track of who's singing and where. It is not easy. Uh, the Breeding Bird Survey, or BBS, is the original large-scale breeding bird monitoring program, and it's the only long-term trend information that we currently have for bird populations in North America. There are now BBS survey routes across the U.S. and into Canada and in northern Mexico. This program began in 1968 and it's entirely volunteer based, so it's a pretty impressive survey effort for that large of a scale. However, surveys are randomly located along roads and observers record birds that they see and hear from a road. So the areas surveyed are limited by road access and we're also limiting our information about bird populations to habitat along roads. So with that in mind, in 2008, Bird Conservancy saw a need for a monitoring program that could provide more rigorous population estimates for breeding birds that wasn't based on surveying along roads. So we got together with a few partners like the Forest Service and Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and we designed a program called Integrated Monitoring in Bird Conservation Regions, or IMBCR. I think I mentioned at the start that I primarily work with this program called IMBCR. Observers survey in all types of habitats on private and public land, and they survey near roads and far from roads. So sometimes we have to hike several miles into our survey locations. Um, quick pop quiz, what is the bird in the bottom right of the slide there? If I had Tootsie Rolls or something, I'd throw them at you in the audience, but I can't throw Tootsie Rolls through the screen. Nice, yes, white-breasted nuthatch. That's also a good backyard bird here in Fort Collins. So today, IMBCR is the second largest breeding bird monitoring program in the country. As of 2020, the extent for IMBCR spans 16 states, from the Great Plains to the Great Basin. This effort includes over 10,000 surveys, over a million bird detections, and we can provide population estimates for more than 270 different bird species. We accomplish this all through the partnership that Bird Conservancy leads with more than 30 state and federal agencies and other nonprofits. Um, okay, one more pop quiz. What do you guys think is the most commonly detected bird across the IMBCR program spanning these 16 states? And it's okay if you're wrong. I'm just curious what, uh, what folks would think. Ooh, okay. Terrence, you're getting all these, these questions right. Uh, Western Meadowlark is indeed a Western Meadowlark. I don't know how many thousands of Western Meadowlark detections we have. And I could have given you guys a little bit of a, a hint. If you look at our logo in the bottom left um, of the screen there, you can see a singing Western Meadowlark. Um, we actually came up with that after we figured out that Western Meadowlark was our most frequently detected bird. Okay. Um, so in addition to monitoring birds during the breeding, um, the breeding season, we also need to monitor populations on the wintering grounds to understand non-breeding populations. And these are known as non-breeding bird surveys. They're not as common, uh, or excuse me, it's not as common to monitor birds during the winter because many birds migrate to other countries or even other continents. And then we just simply don't have access or resources to monitor them. However, it's just as important to monitor non-breeding populations because birds are usually on their breeding grounds for a shorter window compared to where they overwinter. If you look in that figure there um, that shows the full annual cycle for birds, they're really on the breeding grounds for a very short time in the summer compared to where they spend the winter, um, which is shown in red. 
um, further, we could be spending a lot of time and money conserving birds on their breeding grounds, but then miss a big part of their life cycle if we ignore birds on the wintering grounds. For instance, Swainson's hawks migrate up to 7,000 miles and sometimes more to reach their non-breeding grounds in Brazil and Argentina, which is shown in blue on the map. Imagine if we only monitored breeding populations of these birds and completely ignored the non-breeding population in South America. We might see population declines during the breeding season that were a result of habitat loss or pesticide use on their wintering grounds in South America. But if we're not monitoring their non-breeding populations, we would completely miss that and we wouldn't know how best to protect the species from declining. At Bird Conservancy, we monitor many of our grassland birds where they overwinter in southern New Mexico and Arizona, western and southern Texas, and northern Mexico. Um, so that we can learn about population size on the wintering grounds. Because the birds aren't usually singing this time of year, most detections during surveys are either visual or if the bird's making their call note. So in addition to breeding and non-breeding surveys, another type of survey method involves individually tracking birds to monitor their movements and survival with radio signals. This is called radio tracking or radio telemetry. You first need to catch the birds, which is often done with a large net, and after carefully removing the birds from the net, as the gentleman is doing in that photo, we can then fix a little radio transmitter on their back. Uh, can you guys see that transmitter on the back of the bird? I have the, the arrow pointing to it. It's amazing how tiny those have to be to go onto a small little sparrow. Uh, each transmitter then emits a unique radio frequency that's unique to that bird. I was hoping someone wouldn't ask me what type of bird this is. I'm, I thought it was a grasshopper sparrow, but now that I'm looking at the head pattern, I'm honestly not so sure. I could verify that and, uh, and in the follow-up notes that we send out. <laughs> but thank you for asking that question. I should have been more prepared. Maybe Tyler knows what kind of bird that is. Okay, so the biologists can then monitor the bird's location every few days with an antenna to see what habitats they're using, and they can also learn about survival of individuals. Radio transmitters will give off a really fast or a slow signal if the animal hasn't moved in so many hours. So biologists, biologists can use their antenna to locate the dead bird, and this lets them determine the number of birds that die and sometimes how they died, such as the grasshopper sparrow on that photo that was killed by a loggerhead shrike. Radio tracking also allows us to study and monitor birds as they migrate between their winter and breeding grounds so that we can learn about their movements and the locations that they use during this important period. At Bird Conservancy, we are expanding a network of automated radio telemetry stations across the Great Plains to learn more about grassland bird migration. This effort is known as the MODIS Wildlife Tracking System, or just MODIS. At each MODIS station, receivers automatically record signals from the radio transmitters that are attached to the birds so we can get more information about more critters across a larger area without having to go out every few days and track them ourselves. So when I mentioned that we have limited resources to monitor birds um, and to help conserve birds, this kind of gets at that. We can collect more information, more data um, with fewer resources by using something like MODIS. So hopefully by monitoring these birds during the breeding, the non-breeding and migration periods with our various methods, we can best learn how to conserve their populations across the full annual cycle and prevent future declines. Okay, so when we conduct our breeding and our non-breeding surveys, we're typically monitoring a lot of different species at once. Another method for monitoring bird populations involves species specific surveys where we're only monitoring one or a few species at a time. And one reason we might do this is because a species or a group of species is tied to a specific habitat. So unless we're spending most of our time serving that particular habitat, we likely won't get a good estimate of population size. Waterfowl or ducks are a good example of this. We need to target our surveys around ponds, marshes, and other wetland habitat to best survey ducks. Otherwise, we're probably not going to detect many of them. Um, pop quiz, what is the duck shown in that picture? Yes, 
green wing teal. I mean, the, the wings kind of give it away, I guess, on this one, but I think they're a very handsome duck. Okay, so another reason we might conduct species-specific monitoring is if the species is active during a different time of day than the other birds that we're monitoring. Owls are a good example of this. If we didn't conduct surveys at night when most owls are active and hunting for food, we likely would not count many. Count many. Um, you guys guessed it, uh, pop quiz. What is that owl shown in the picture? Nice, okay, got a couple of right answers. Great horned owl. At Bird Conservancy, we also have a few species specific monitoring efforts because we're interested in learning more about specific behaviors of those species. For example, black swifts are a mysterious bird and no one knows much about them. They feed on insects and they nest in colonies near waterfall, waterfalls in rugged areas such as southwestern Colorado. Biologists at Bird Conservancy wanted to learn where these birds winter and also the migration route that they take to get there. So we put some geolocators on a few birds which allowed us to gather location data on this mysterious bird. We learned the migration path for black swifts breeding in Colorado and you can see their migration path in purple there going along um, the Pacific coast along Mexico, Central America, and down to South America and then they discover that they winter in the rainforest of Brazil. And by using even newer technology, we learned recently that black swifts travel almost 100 miles every day to feed at about 10,000 feet up in the sky. That's pretty impressive for a very small bird. And this next photo, you can kind of see Rob Sparks, one of our biologists, is holding a black swift. So they are not a big bird to be, to be moving that much. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about this cool project, you can check out our events page for Bird Conservancy. Rob will be giving a lecture on black swifts and our monitoring and research efforts on October 22nd, which I believe is a Thursday uh, from 5 to 6 p.m. So, so <clears throat> Excuse me. Some species are easy to monitor when they're breeding because they gather in large conspicuous groups. Greater sage grouse live in the western states where we have large expanses of sagebrush shrublands. Every spring, the birds gather on communal breeding grounds known as leks, and the males give quite the display to attract females to mate with. Um, the males will jump up in the air, they'll fight with each other, they pop, pop their air sacs and strut. And to monitor sage grouse populations, biologists visit these leks every spring to count the number of birds that they see. Um, and I want to show a really cool video here um, because I think that these birds are just so fun to watch. So let's do a quick share here. Do you guys see the screen with the sage grouse on it? Yes, we do. Okay. Cool. We'll just play it for a few seconds. You hear that? This male gray <laughs> that was the, the air sax air sax popping. Okay. You ready? Can you go back here? Okay. Alrighty. Oh shoot, now do you see my screen? Yes, it was in <laughs> Okay. Okay, let me there you go. Okay, perfect. Um Okay, lastly, I just wanna mention a few other methods that we use to monitor bird populations, such as nest monitoring. We can search for nests and determine the success of those, of those nests and also follow chicks to determine the success of any chicks that hatch in the nests. Is nest success high or low? And how about chick survival? Those pieces of information can really help us understand why bird populations might be declining and where we can direct our conservation efforts. Um, can you see how many chicks are in that bottom photo? It's amazing how well they blend into that, that environment. And I will not ask you to identify um, the species of them. 
Yes, yep, Terrence, there are three chicks there. Um, and I only know that these are horn lark chicks, which is our most common bird in Colorado, um, because I saw a parent feeding them um, when we were camped out doing field work. Gosh, I was always afraid I was gonna step on them though, because they blend in so well. Uh, acoustic monitoring is a fairly new technique that allows us to passively monitor birds by recording their sounds over a certain time period. We then use software to try and identify the species making the sounds, or we can manually review all the recorded sounds, which as you can imagine, takes a long time. We've used these devices at Bird Conservancy for a Mexican spotted owl monitoring program, but I believe we are still working out the kinks for them. And a final method that I'll mention that uh, one of you also mentioned for monitoring bird populations is bird banding stations. Uh, how many of you have joined Colin, Meredith, or someone else at a bird banding station? Bird banding has been around for a long time, over 100 years, and it allows us to track individual birds over time with the use of numbered bands, so no fancy equipment needed. You simply catch the birds with a net, apply a unique set of numbered bands to their leg, and then see if they are recaptured the following year at the same or a different banding station. The banding information tells us about migratory routes and timings, lifespans of the birds, and also long-term population trends. We can also use combinations of color bands to uniquely identify individuals without having to recapture them and read the numbered bands. Um, and I pointed out, with an air on this, but hopefully you guys can see the colored bands there on the mountain plover's legs. You can imagine how careful you need to be if you have an, you know, the tool to actually apply the band to the leg. I would be afraid that I would break their poor little leg. Okay, so now that we've gone over some of the reasons why we monitor and some methods for how we monitor bird populations, you might be wondering, how can I get involved with monitoring efforts? At least I hope maybe you're thinking that. There are a few options if you'd like to get involved. Um, you can volunteer to survey a breeding bird survey route. You need to have really good bird ID skills and of course a card. And if you're interested, um, if you have those things, a car and some good, good bird ID skills and binoculars, um, you can visit the BBS webpage, just Google breeding bird survey. And there should be a couple links for um, how to get involved, either vacant routes or participate. And you should be able to sign up to, to do that. I'm sure they're always looking for volunteers to help cover routes. Um, you can also contribute to citizen science monitoring efforts, which are increasingly being used to help monitor bird populations. And citizen science is just public participation in scientific research. So I would consider bird monitoring scientific research. And one easy way to participate in citizen science efforts um, is if you go birding for fun on your own, you can then contribute those observations to eBird. You'll have to create an account, but then it's really easy to submit your observations and contribute to bird data in your region. And this information is currently being used to develop new tools for bird conservation, like full annual cycle trends. Um, if you haven't played around on eBird, uh, I'd encourage it. It's, it's really fun to explore birds in your region and look at some of the, the tools that they have for showing when and, and where birds are migrating. Another citizen science effort is the annual Christmas bird count, which is actually our longest running community science bird project in the US. Every year, volunteers trudge out, often in the cold, and they count birds that are seen or heard along established routes. The Christmas bird count is conducted between mid-December and early January, and volunteers usually go out in groups in the morning, um, usually on one particular day is, is kind of the big effort for Christmas bird count, and then they survey for birds for several hours. The observations are then collected each year um, and they're used to estimate population trends for wintering birds. And oh, yep, looks like Sarah's on top of putting these the links up to, to join these. Um, they should be run through your local Audubon chapter, but that link that Sarah has should take you there. I've done this for several years and even though it's cold, it is a lot of fun because it seems like every year you're going to see something unique or something that's that's out of the ordinary. I think our third year doing our our Christmas bird count route, we saw a northern shrike, which is not super common for us up here, and it was feeding on a house finch. So that was not good for the house finch, but that was pretty cool to see. 
Okay, and lastly, you can always support organizations like Bird Conservancy or your own local bird conservation group that are using monitoring programs to learn about birds so that we can better protect them. Um, in fact, we have an upcoming virtual fundraiser in two weeks on October 16th, and one of our live auction items is a chance to name a MODIS radio telemetry station after yourself or for a loved one. Um, that's a that's a pretty cool prize to bid on. And then you'd really be in, involved in bird monitoring for a very long time because, you know, your name's attached to it. So, um, so check that out. I'm sure there's other, other cool prizes that we have to auction on, but I think that's a pretty neat one. And, and certainly relevant for bird monitoring. Um, so besides contributing to these monitoring efforts, um, you can follow one or any of these suggestions that will just help birds in general. A lot of birds every year fly into windows and die. Um, so just putting up some, you know, some window stickers or decals, putting up tape or even um, some paint strips in your window or keeping the blinds partially closed can prevent birds from flying into them. Uh, keeping your cat indoors is good not only for birds, but it's, it's certainly good for your cat as well. Um, planting more native flowers and, and shrubs in your yard and also with your garden, maybe using less or, or no pesticides. Um, if you're a coffee drinker like I am, um, and you're able to maybe spend a few bucks more and buy the bird-friendly coffee. Um, using less plastic in general is good for the environment, but it's also really good for birds because otherwise they get a lot of plastic in their environment and then they ingest that plastic and you can imagine how that ends. Um, and then finally, if you enjoy birds and you're getting out there watching birds, share what you see. Um, if you have a Facebook page or an Instagram account, be sure to share what you're seeing because it there's a good chance it's going to inspire other people and um yeah and you're just going to maybe help help spread the word that the birds are pretty cool okay so that is all that i have on population monitoring for birds um but feel free to type in any questions that you have in the chat box despite our technical difficulties we still have um some time here so um you can ask questions or feel free to keep in touch with us. Um, I know our, our education team in particular has, has suffered a bit of a hit for revenue this past spring and summer due to the pandemic. We're not able to, to have as many programs as we usually have and, and reach out to as many people. And that really helps us bring in um, funding to cover our salary for folks like Sarah. So if, if you like what you see and you're in a position to support these programs, please check out our website um, if you can donate. Otherwise, just, uh, yeah, keep getting out there to look at birds. And if you have a feeder up, I'm sure the birds appreciate that. Um, also, we'll be sending out a survey later this week and we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, as not just our education team, but our science team also is moving to more virtual programs and presentations. So if there's any way that we can improve those virtual experiences, um, that feedback is really helpful for us. So yeah, that's all I have for material, but again, feel free to stick around or type questions in the chat box. All right, thank you so much, Jen. I, I learned so much, that was really, really interesting. Um, so yes, please type in questions if you have them in the chat box, um, if you're like me and you're a person that kind of slowly takes in information and processes it, uh, you can always email us your questions later and we'll get them answered. Um, and one thing I kind of wanted to plug eBird and Citizen Science a little bit more. And Jen, correct me if I'm wrong or add, I believe that the 3 billion birds study that she referenced really heavily relied on citizen science data, from, particularly from breeding bird survey. We don't have quite enough data from eBird yet, but in the future, I mean, that was a monumental study to know exactly how many birds we've lost. Um, and that was solely due to citizen science. So even though you are, you feel like you're just out enjoying a hike and counting birds, if you are entering that data into your phone or your computer when you get home, um, it makes a huge, huge difference to bird conservation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, BBS data were the main was the main data source for that that study, Sarah. But actually, it, it, they used they pulled uh, monitoring data from a lot of different um, programs, including IMBCR and some others. So it really just goes to show that the more we know, um, the more data sets we have, the more we can pull from 
the more accurate picture we're going to get for bird populations. And, and again, it's, it's a good thing. It's not necessarily all doom and gloom. Some populations could be doing really well, but you know, we, we don't know that if we, if we don't get out there and we don't count them or we don't survey them. Absolutely. Um, Terrence has a really great question. So they're wondering uh, what are some challenges that we have with MODIS stations in our geographical area? Because down there in Louisiana, um, with marshland and everything, they, they don't have a stable structure to put them on. So mm -hmm. is there anything we face out here? Um, you know, that's, that's a good question. I would say for us, you know, a lot of grassland birds, they are adapted to environments that don't have trees and other tall structures. And so we're proposing to go put out these tall, you know, radio stations essentially, or these towers, so that we can gather data on birds. So I think one of the challenges for us in, in the Great Plains area is that we don't want to contribute to that infrastructure that birds aren't adapted to. Um, so we're trying really hard to find existing structures that we can put the radio stations on. So we're not adding to that. Um, I would, I'd be kind of curious on the weather. We get a lot of wind in the Great Plains. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm sure they really secure those radio stations very, very well. But I'd imagine if we get a bad enough windstorm that that could possibly damage the radio station or the radio tower as well. And from what I understand too, um, the MODIS towers are pretty new to the Great Plains. They're primarily out east and Bird Conservancy is helping to get them more out this direction. Yeah, yeah, so there's that, yeah, that's a great point. There's probably a lot that we haven't learned yet. Um, and I think that's where it's cool that Bird Conservancy is involved in this and we're really leading the effort on getting these stations put up in the Great Plains because yeah, we just, we're a little bit behind, I think, our, our East Coast friends um, and learning about migration and, and things like that. And we're trying to make up for it. And, and um, Matt Webb is, is our biologist who's really helping us to, to get up to speed and, and learn about migration out here. Uh, I see a question from Andrea on what's the connection between coffee production and bird health, and that's that's a good question. Um, if you travel to you know Central or South America, um, oftentimes on the hillsides you can see these coffee plantations, um, and they're pretty extensive because a lot of people like to drink coffee, so it takes a lot of um, coffee trees to supply that for everyone. Um, and the, the main issue with coffee, which is similar to bananas and olive oil and other things, is that in order to keep up with the demand for that product, we have to really go in and plant this monoculture of this one species. And so when you have just one tree, just one plant in a large area, it's really bad for bird diversity. Um, it doesn't provide you know, the food resources that birds need and, and the structure that they need for nesting and things like that. So um, what they're trying to do with shade grown coffee, I think is just that um, you have other, other trees and you have more structure in those, those areas. So you're not taking over maybe the best, the best habitat to plant your coffee plantation. You're trying to use kind of, I guess, existing areas where you can plant those trees and trees that that coffee plants that do better in, in shade, shady areas so that our sunny areas can stay those nice, you know, forests with lots of structure and diversity. So it's basically just where are you putting that, that coffee plantation? Oh, and uh, Birds and Beans is the brand that I like um, the most. It, again, it is, a, it is a little bit pricier than your Folgers or your, um, you know, Seattle's best, things like that. Um, but I think the taste is is just as good, if not better. Um, so yeah, check out check out Birds and Beans. There's, I'm sure others, if you just Google shade grown coffee, that that's one that I like. Yeah, and um, I believe it's through Smithsonian there. So just like food has to undergo, you know, certain restrictions to be labeled organic. Um, the Smithsonian is working on a, a label for specifically for bird friendly coffee. Um, and I think it's gold and I haven't seen it in any like mainstream stores. So you can um, advocate by, by asking your local grocery store to carry those. Um, but like Jen said, even if you look for um, brands that have, that are like Rainforest Alliance certified that have the little green tree frog on them, um, those, those are helpful too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, Terrence, that's a good point. It is 
I'd say the bird friendly coffee is very similar to the ranch program, the Audubon ranching program. They're just trying to provide more of an incentive um, for consumers to, to buy these products that might cost a little bit more, but to know that you're supporting ranchers and producers who are trying to do a little bit, a little bit better for the birds in their region. So. Definitely. And I'll do um, a little bit of a shameless plug here. <laughs> um, we are partnering with Denver Audubon and I'll actually be giving a webinar um, about bird friendly coffee and they're starting to work on bird friendly cacao as well. Um, so that will be on November 10th and that um, eventually pretty soon here will be on our website um, or on our Facebook page so you can register for that. Cool. Uh, yeah, I think I would probably, I could benefit to learn a bit more about shade grown coffee and bird friendly coffee. I really don't know a ton. So mm -hmm. to check that yeah, out. it is really interesting. And, and exactly like you said, Jen, it's about, um, you know, just like when you're buying organic food or, you know, fair trade items, it, it's about supporting those communities that are really impacted by, by a lot of different um, environmental injustices. Yeah. So Terrence is wondering what different species are you using the MODIS and geolocators on? Oh yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, so because the stations are going up in, in the Great Plains, we're really targeting grassland birds and in particular grassland sparrows. Um, so I know our efforts right now are focusing on grasshopper sparrows and baird sparrows. Um, also partially because those are the species that we're also detecting down um, in the non-breeding grounds where they winter. Um, so we're really trying to get that, capture that full annual cycle of them. So where they're breeding up in the Great Plains, where they're migrating, and then where they're spending their winters. So I would say those are the two main species, but um, I'm sure any other grassland species that they catch like Clark Buntings or Sprague's Pipits, um, they would probably put the geolocators on as well. Very cool. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions, so I think we will wrap up for, for the day. But again, I wanted to thank everyone for registering and joining us this morning. Jen, we really appreciate you being here and sharing your expertise. Um, and again, just check out our website or our Facebook page, um, so birdconservancy.org. And we have some really exciting events coming up. Our fall fundraiser, like Jen mentioned, um, it is going to be virtual, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I know that our development director has been working really, really hard on it. And there's going to be some fun activities and really cool things that you can bid on. Um, so be sure to check that out on our website. Um, and thank you all so much. And keep birding and stay safe. Mm -hmm. We'll see you soon. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Mm -hmm.